Witam Państwa serdecznie na dyskusji poświęconej dźwiękowi w kulturze cyfrowej. Dzisiaj jest Europejski Dzień Języków Obcych. W związku z tym będziemy rozmawiali w lingua franca of digital audio world, which is English. So uh, I would like to invite the audience and uh, our guests. Uh, I'm privileged to host the discussion uh, with your own ears on the audio in digital culture. My name is Leszek Karczewski. And uh, uh, we've got with us some uh, very famous uh, creators of uh, digital audio. Uh, um, Oliver Darivier, uh, the man behind the music uh, of Assassin's Creed 4. Ad uh, Adam Skorupa, uh, the author of the music, uh, for example, for the first part of the Witcher saga, uh, Martin Stick Anderson, um, the composer of music or um, the soundtrack of Limbo and Inside, and uh, Krzysztof Czeczot, who is actor, uh, director, and the owner of uh, publishing house Osorno, releasing uh, audio plays. Um, so uh, I would like to start with a very fundamental uh, question uh, concerning your maybe childhood or at least uh, more um, uh, former days. Um, what is the very first digital audio sound you remember still? And uh, which sound you've ever heard uh, you found interesting still, still valid, still inspiring uh, for you. Uh, uh, what is the sound has convinced you to, to uh, uh, become a creator within the world of digital audio? So I start. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. Um, well, um, the first thing that very, very much made an impression on me was not the sound, but the pixel moving. You know, that's, that's something that made me like crazy. And then when I heard the sound that was on the Commodore 64, you know, this beep, you know, like this, I was like, yeah, that's interesting. I can, you know, I can hear some music, but the pixel was like impressive to me. And then the Commodore uh, 500 came out and with this game called Shadow of the Beast. I don't know if you guys, I mean, you're young, I'm old, starting to get old. And there is a Commodore, uh, maybe uh, uh, 1200, down there, but on the 500 there is Shadow of the Beast. I don't know if you know this game, but it was made by Psynosis at the time, and the composer was David Whittaker, and from this very moment, I knew that I wanted to make video games music because it was unique, it was real time, and the, the colors were, you know, Amiga style. Do you still remember the tune? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I know. Sorry, I'm a bad singer. But, um, but uh, anyways, the thing is that I came back home and it was when the CD came out. You know, C you know CDs, all right? <laughs> and, I st and I told my dad, I said, okay, you can, you can get away with your CD, you know, Amiga's better. Adam? Hi, um, proud to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I remember the sound design made for Pac-Man, the arcade uh, game. It was developed in uh, 1980s by Namco, as far as I remember. I was only five years old, but till that moment, I remember that sounds, especially the, the sound of uh, you know the eating the dots, uh, waka 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 waka. You know that sound. So um, it still uh, rings in my in my head. And after that years, I think it was so cool, so unique and so impossible to do and that was the moment i asked myself okay how did they done that is it possible to to do something like that so unique some something like that and that was the, the first moment when i asked myself i really would like to do that but if i can uh maybe not uh i would try my best and i decided to to be sound designer as well as the music composer martin yeah, thanks a lot for having me today. Um, yeah, I think it's a, an interesting question because I guess there's a difference between like a digitally generated sound and a, like a just digitally represented sound. And for me, I'm I'm always had like a strong preference for uh, organic sound. So I can't really say that 
ever been like any like digital generated sound that really uh, made it uh, for me. So it's it's much more about uh, the opportunity to um, to work with uh, organic sounds. Like when I, I was a kid, I was exper experimenting with uh, like a four track uh, tape recorder, um, and I was kind of. Uh, inspired by the possibilities and then of course when the digital tools came there was like a big like opening in a way that you could process sound and put them together in, in different ways but for me it's always been about recorded sounds and uh, so not so much like digital sound but more like the, um, the possibilities in, in digital media to, to process, transform and organize sounds. Krzysztof. Yes, uh, thank you for having me here. Um, I came from, I, I was grown, I, I grown in a small town in Kashuba region, so I remember the most, uh, I remember uh, the sound of fields, of lakes, because I don't have any, uh, I didn't have any computer and stuff like this to listen to sounds. <laughs> so my childhood was connected with the natural. Sound. Sound. Organ mentioned sound. by Martin. Yes. Okay, um, what is your personal path towards the digital audio creation? Uh, then maybe, Krzysztof, mm -hmm. you've got the opportunity to it's, emphasize It's silly, it's sad, but when I bought the first uh, Walkman, you remember Walkman for sure, <laughs> I bought also the Deep Forest. There is a band, let's call very bad. Deep word, forest. World music. Oh. World music, yes. I'm, I'm really ashamed of it. But I did it. And I remember that my first exp impression, uh, they used something like uh, um, in the first song, in the first tape which I bought, there is a, a sound w which is going around the head. Something like that, that the birds are singing around. Even we, we, still, this is the, the the stereo sound, but it's they did something strange, and I thought, and I thought, wow, this is something, this is something good. But the music was creepy, of course. <laughs> yeah, to me, um, uh, when I was a kid, I was playing the. I remember already in my my childhood, I feel like really limited by the you know the 88 keys and and, and the keyboard and, and the piano. I, f I felt I wasn't that I wasn't in like direct touch with the sound, you know, and I have this kind of idea that it would be awesome to have sound and just mold it like clay in a way. So I always had this as a child, like a frus frustration. I always felt like, you know, ripping the piano apart. It was kind of a, a thing I just, I just had. And then I think later when I studied at the um, conservatory, I got um, aware of uh, electroacoustic composition where you are using uh, software basically to process sound and structure it in, in new ways. So um, yeah, I think one of the things that makes made the most impact for me was like the software from IACAM in, uh, in, in Paris, where you could take like one sound and, and mix it up with another, like a, a, a spectral in, interpolation where you like multiply the spectrums of, of uh, two different different sounds and then you get something totally new out of it and then also uh, to work more in a kind of a collage style where it's you know it's not much about rhythm and harmony but it's it's more about yeah I don't know more like uh, yeah collage or working with uh, real world sounds so uh, to summarize it your background for digital culture audio is rather concrete music than orchestral arrangements and so on. Originally I studied uh, like orchestral composition, but then I went on to study electroacoustic music in, uh, in London. My story is uh, so funny, but uh, it's too long to, to tell you all about that. So in short, I never supposed that I will be music composer or sound designer. It was picked by my friends. They told me, you need to be composer and I agreed. So uh, <laughs> that's in short. I'm I'm self-educated and uh, don't have any uh, musical background. It just happened, and I'm enjoying that moment. 
and enjoying the um, doing the music till that moment and with the sound design uh, well uh, when i started to be composer and we started to believe that we uh, i mean me and my friends can do some games somebody needed to do sound design as well so they told me again you need to be sound designer as well and i agreed that's it well i i might have followed the same path as you did uh not you sorry <laughs> But, uh, but I do respect what you, you've been through because I, I believe that you don't need to be educated to write good music. Um, uh, but actually, um, yeah, I, I think the digital world is where uh, the, um, let's say, artistic opening is, you know, the widest. It's like you can do whatever you want, you know, as soon as you start understanding, you know, just like a reverb. With one reverb, you can do so much, okay? And this is what is very, very, let's say, um, there is like a, a separation in my mind, like the conventional, like conservative approach with the orchestra and then the electronic music. And this is something that I don't like at all. What I do myself, which is sort of not exactly what you're doing, I guess, but we're very close, is that I go record and I post process the conventional writing with electronic. And this is where the digital world is very useful and it's even better with games because everything happens in real time and I guess this is where we're going to. So, so don't you think that formal education, uh, conservatory for example, is a uh, necessary prerequisite for uh, creating a, a musical audio? Or maybe in digital culture we've got a much more democratized situation in which any user can participate in uh, this creative process we've mentioned. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't think it's uh, necessary today. And I, I feel at least in, in Denmark, uh, the young students that, uh, that come into the conservatory and, and universities, you know, they have their own uh, agenda in a way. Uh, and they are just there, you know, to, to get the, like the compensation from the state, you know, then they get access to studios and and they create their own kind of uh, environment there. So they have, yeah, they have, uh, have a strong agenda th themselves. So it's not a necessity, but um, so today it's much more just uh, you know, a way of facilitating them working and, and getting together. Uh, whereas when I was studying back in the day, it was much more with uh, theory and all, that, all those kind of things. You, you don't see that. So maybe this is an obstacle in, in this uh, uh, digital audio creations. Uh, this a bit conservatory knowledge about uh, uh, theory of music. It depends a lot on, on the institution. Because for example, where I started in, in, in London, what I liked about it and why I came there was because we never discussed technology actually was sort of uh, forbidden to discuss so if we have like classes we would uh, play uh, our pieces to each other and we weren't even allowed to say the title of the piece and then the the, the students should uh, share their reaction to uh, to the piece of music and they were not allowed to ask you know what did you think about the structure how did you create this and that it was only like the you know the auditory response you know, their experience with the music, and that created a lot of uh, interesting discussions. I remember when I came there, at first I didn't understand, you know, what they were talking about. But they were kind of developing a language, language for discussing, you know, what you actually hear. Well, I think that dedicated education is not necessary, and I'm living proof of that. Um, I agree with Martin that uh, education sometimes can uh, make some complications because they are giving you some rules and they are teaching you some rules they are or they they are useful but all about the crea creativity is a breaking the rules so if you don't know the rules you are breaking them just like that right well yes and no <laughs> well, i think i disagree a little with you guys because i think that uh, to get educated is something it depends on the music you want to write it depends on what you want to do. If you want to go orchestral music, if you want to do something that has to, you know, take what was 
done before and what you want to do after that you have to understand what was done before not like maybe at the best you know understanding but at least you have to understand what's harmony what's what's an instrument you know you have to study and it's also true when it goes to electronic music if you don't know what you know an oscillator is you know what voltage means all of that you need to study doesn't necessarily mean that you need to go to a conservatory or something like this but you have to work hard you have to educate yourself on your own but uh, you know at some point there will be a limitation you know and this limitation can be you know uh, because of your education I myself sometimes I'm like oh my god I don't know how to do this you know so and I need to, to study a lot so studying is a key Christoph, and what about uh, your uh, path? What about your uh, education? I am another musician. Uh, of course, I, I did the, the, the music school first degree in piano and in guitar, but uh, <laughs> this is not uh, what I feel good. And in, in my company, we, we have something like we are, we are talking to each other. We have a guys from the conservatory and uh, um, self-educated guys, and we, we are trying to join them because this is the best way to, to uh, achieve what we need to, what we want to achieve. And the second thing is that the guys from the conservatory, who, who finished the conservatory, they, they are using all the time some kind of uh, uh, schemes, I mean, uh, schemes, schemate, schemes, yes. And the, uh, the, the self educated, they are free. They are looking for some other um, uh, ways to, to express themselves. So, this is the different well, what I see in it. Concerning the creative process, still, um, what is your workflow? Uh, do you start with a pencil and just sheets of uh, musical notation paper or um, next to the keyboard of your grand piano or next to the screen of your digital audio workstation? And what is the starting point um, of composing and sound designing? Um, selecting musical scales or um, sculpting some patches in synthesizers. What is your workflow? Uh, Oliver, maybe. Oh, sorry, Adam. I have a mic. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, every time it's different. Uh, sometimes it's just happening because I hear some music in my head. Yes, I hear voices. And uh, I'm trying to rewrite all of that, what I'm hearing in my head on, you know, synthesizer connected to DAW. Sometimes I'm starting with, you know, for example, I'm surfing through the music library with some nice presets and I'm just finding some so cool sounding preset and I think okay this is a good base to to build the, all the arrangement around that specific sound because it's so freaking awesome. Uh, sometimes um, it depends of the genre of the of the game kind of project because um, some projects needs to to start with the rhythms. Uh, uh, some projects are mainly melodies oriented so I need to work on the melodies first and then I need to build up all the arrangement around the melodies so it's there is no one strictly good answer to that question for me and I still have Mike all right. well um, I don't know uh, truly uh, it depends and mostly the way I start is always with a conversation because we're I mean, I'm here talking about music for games, you know, my experience with this and uh, working with games is like music needs to serve a game. So I need to listen to the creative director, which is like the director if it was a movie. And mostly I take ideas from the game itself. So either it can be, you know, a situation, a gameplay, a story or the vision or anything like that. Now, when, it, when I need to transfer this to music, it depends once again, as you say, uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, if most of the time I go uh, with uh, live uh, musicians, you know, either it's, you know, just, uh, I don't know, tribal or uh, orchestra or anything like this, or vocal, you know, choir. Uh, and you cannot, I mean, I don't know if you can do that, but I've never tried, you know, do something like, right now I'm working with the uh, children's choir, and uh, you cannot do this with samples, so you have to write the music, you know, 
on paper, I mean, it's no paper now, it's Sibelius or Dorico, if you know Dorico guys, but um, so it's a, it's a very different process every time. And it's dictated, once again, it depends on the music you want it to do, if it's synth, if it's live, if there is no... Martin. Um, I, sp I somehow like to believe that I'm not knowing what I'm doing when I'm starting on, on, on something and then starting with like pure uh, experimentation. Of course, that's not true. That's just what I want to uh, <laughs> believe that I'm that I'm doing. You know, to keep things open and uh, try new things. And I think as much as finding like a musical style, I also like to find like a sound. I don't have the right term for for that, but it's. Uh, just like a sound quality or something to it. For example, if you know, like Limbo, that's um, very like distorted and, and grainy, and that's that's kind of a, an, an important part of the the process. Yeah, and then, as I was referring to before, it's also very much about you know getting some some source material, and that can be whatever sound recordings. I think often it's like. Uh, uh, mangled metal or whatever kind of uh, organic sounds that I can get and then I start to um, to process those and experiment with them and then eventually I'm putting them uh, together and uh, in the in that sense I'm very much following like the music concrete like the, this uh, French style where it's, it's it's people think of music concrete as something that's about using real world sounds which is kind of a misconception in a way because the the concrete is like an opponent to the abstract and uh, Pierre Schaeffer who uh, coined the term music con con concrete um, he thought that working with the score and the uh, instrumentalist was kind of there was kind of an abstraction layer between the score and the musician you had to imagine, you know, how it would sound, and you would write it on score, and then afterwards you would hear it. Which has a lot of uh, there's a lot of good things about that as well, you know, because often when you only do stuff that you can imagine or hear, instantly you kind of it's kind of hard to uh, to go new places uh, in a way. But I think he he had a point in 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 that. Uh, that was the kind of working with the concrete medium, which back in the day was was the tape. You know, the piece, the final piece that you would hear, was the same, like physically the same piece as you would were composing in the process. You know, the tape, you would cutting the tape, and then in the end, that that would be the the composition. Uh, so so in that way. Uh, and I think really for me it was kind of a reaction, like working with with the score and too much conceptualization in a way that I really I really like, you know, to have the, you know, the, to uh, to hear what I'm doing and make all my decisions based on, on on what I hear. So for me, it's it's only done when 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 it's kind of satisfying uh, to my ears in a way. So it, it is this kind of uh, empirical process in a way. Thank you. And uh, what is the uh, starting point uh, in the case of a new audio plate? We are looking for uh, the source of sound. We are talking about the source of sound and it, it's always, always in an emotion. So we are looking the source of emotion of, uh, of some scene or, or characters and so on. So the, basically we are talking about the mood, uh, about the, 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 the way of expression how to express the, um, the scene or, 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 or the character. And at the end, we are trying to uh, to, to get, I mean, what's important. We, you need to remember that we are, we are uh, working with audiobooks, okay? So the, 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 the most important is the word. Uh, the, the people need to follow the story. So we are trying to not interrupt it. So we are trying to to get the the listener to the into the story, but but still um, we are trying to not be over sound. Let me say something like. So, so what is the role, for example, of uh, casting voices uh, for voiceovers, casting actors for? They need to be uh, the, the most important. That is that the, the actors actress should have the morning voice. 
morning voice. I mean, the, like 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 mine now. So the, it it it's it it's really important that it's it has to be something behind the voice. I mean, not only the the good uh, the, the good quality of uh, of uh, sound, but still something like some magic in it. It's it's very hard to to, to express it. It's it. We are we are searching for, for of course the well known Polish actors. It's important. With golden voices. With golden voices, exactly. Yes. Uh, I would like to disclose that we are uh, one question uh, before the end of first round. So prepare at least one question uh, concerning creative process for our guests. But now. Uh, can you uh, uh, can you um, uh, describe your your working environment? Uh, is it personal studio? Is it just an application in your laptop? I think nowadays everybody has a laptop or a computer and works on it. Uh, either you write score or you produce score or anything like this. Then depends on everybody, I guess. If you want to, you know. If you want to buy uh, so many gears, you know about electronic music, or if you want to buy the best mics to record, if you have a little space at your place. My place is very simple. There is just one computer. I don't do the uh, top gear of electronic, you know, like racks and things like this. I'm not into this. You know, I'm using mostly. I don't know if you know, but Reactor. You know, this is what I do most of it uh, concerning post production. So it's just one computer, but. You know, the money goes to the musicians, the performers. Uh, we're going to, you know, the best place, hiring the best musicians to get the best performance uh, for me then to screw up, you know, the performance with my uh, post-processing. Um, I have my home mini studio. Uh, it looks pro uh, and, uh, well, you know, stuff like that, like acoustic covers on the walls and uh, things like that. Since I'm uh, doing both uh, music and sound design, I need to be prepared to, to record some fo follies. So I have some recording booth, uh, bigger than usual one, just to you know smash some vegetables and stuff like that. Or smash the instrumentalist, uh, which uh, doesn't play like I wish. Uh, so I'm recording also instrumentalist single one uh, or voice actors, if it's necessary. The same like... Um, Olivier, if I need to record some bigger uh, uh, stuff, a bigger team, I, I need to go to, to some different places uh, just to record the orchestra or choir. But for the minimum, for the sketching or some single uh, stuff, I'm prepared and I have all that funny, expensive gadgets you mentioned. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a, a studio as well. And, um, because of my process, everything happens in the uh, in the studio, and I don't. I actually don't work on a laptop. I just have to have everything assembled, and I just have to push a button, and then it then it works. Um, and um, yeah, I'm using a lot of like old hardware, not synthesizers, but like spring reverbs and things like that. But that's mainly to um, because when I do like digital. Processing. Uh, sometimes I get some like artifacts, like digital artifacts, which I <laughs> don't really like. D so I kind of process them uh, also through tubes and things like that to get a more like organic result. So it's almost like even if I do like heavily processed sound, I like to imagine that the sound could like potentially uh, exist in the physical world and and sometimes it's you know it's kind of old spring reverbs or whatever can, can do, help do, me do you that. have still a human skull uh, in your studio uh, yeah but I'm, I'm not using it yeah those. could you could you explain the um, origins of this human skull and uh, yeah it was, it was just an idea I had a long time ago about uh, it was a study done in uh, Stanford University. There was a, a singer there, and she wanted to. She would. Have, she was annoyed that you know hearing the recording of her voice was very different from how it sounded in in her head. And we we all know that sometimes we get shocked when we hear our own uh, voice uh, recorded. So um, so she wanted to have a recording where her voice sounded as it did in uh, in her head. So. Um, they did some measuring with the contact microphones and made some kind of transfer function so they could kind of apply that kind of 
EQ or whatever to to uh, the voice recording. So, and and the reason for that is that uh, half of not I don't know if it's half of the sounds, but a lot of the sounds that we hear when we we speak is actually the sound like conducted through our bones. It's basically the the jaw bone, so it sounds a bit softer in in our head. Um, and actually, it's it's also it's also used by the military, you know, to um, because they, they like soldiers they don't want to have their ear blocks blocked, obviously. So they have some device attached to like almost the like pressing to through uh, towards the skull because then they can have uh, information uh, that way. So um, so ba basically, my process was and that was for, for the game inside. Uh, yeah, finally, it came to uh, to the name inside. It didn't have that name when I was doing it, but it kind of make make makes sense, you know. This kind of this inside your head sound. So um, yeah, so basically, it was uh, that was kind of the idea to um, to play sound through the, uh, the skull, like especially the jawbone. So I would take like a, a transducer, which is a, like a regular speaker, but without the membrane, and you can attach it to a window or to this table, and it would actually play quite loud. What to loud. A human skull? Uh, yeah, and then I attached the human skull to that, and then some contact microphone, and I routed it through my sequencer and uh, as a plug-in, and I named it Scully, uh, and I could like batch process sound through uh, that. Uh, and in the end, uh, I didn't use it that much to c create this kind of subjective sound, but it was more like working as a filter. So of course, it's uh, the style is kind of retro, almost like 80s horror uh, movies. Uh, so uh, I wanted to have like an element of a, of a synth soundtrack without actually having a synth soundtrack because it would be like too much of a of a statement in a way. So um, I took all the kind of synth material and processed it through uh, the skull, and it got this kind of a bit like nasty quality. Christoph, what about your uh, work in? I have my own studio, my ordinary own studio with an um, extraordinary people. So, um, uh, and and it looks uh, the same like I said before. We've got also extraordinary audience, so uh, questions? Hello, uh, very interesting. I had a question about, you know, like how as 3D audio and Amazonics is developing as a delivery medium also, that we can put on headphone and get a more, not just stereo, a more 3D-oriented sound. In that sound space, how does music or, let's say, a more classical orchestral music fit in? Does it fit in at all? Well, I've just done a game uh, using Ambisonic, uh, not a uh, tracking. You know, you know the difference between, between, you know, you can track the movements of your head, okay? So it didn't track, you know, it was like rendering in Ambisonic, okay? So if you do... Uh, move like this, it doesn't change. But if you move with the controller, then it changes. So the way, uh, what you're talking about is something completely different uh, in terms of approach. And this is what we've been trying on the last game. I worked a uh, Polish developer, Form 51, called GetEven. And uh, it's when the surrounding is sort of the musical score. For instance, what we did is like, here you have a room tone. OK, if I stop talking, we hear. This sound, you know, it's like okay, that's a note. Okay, so I can take this and be like, okay. And what we did is for each room, you know, you were in, we had like emitters all around the room. So if you turn around, you can hear surrounding you. Okay, and it was like a note. So this would be the premises for the music to start. Then a drone would comes in very, very low and build up, and you know, so the music will be around you. But what you're talking about then is the rendering the second layer, which is like the perception, okay, ambisonic, how you will feel, you know, with ambisonic. So uh, the thing is, most of the time what happens with games right now, if you don't use some plugins, okay, let's say the one we used was uh, Oro 3D, uh, it gives every emitter, even though you want to diffuse the sound, you know, as much as you want, it won't, I mean, the definition of the, the sound will be very, very, let's say, defined in the world. You can be like, oh, that's there, that's there, which is very unnatural. We're, we're not hearing things this way. You know, it's much more like a, let's say, a global thing, you know? And so with Ambisonic plugins, you know, on top, so the rendering of this will create this sort of diffuse 
yet you can still hear it's coming it's coming from there but in a much natural you know way so much more natural so that's but it's it's different so if and now we're talking about music and we can talk later about this but you know that's half an answer thank you Thank you for this question because uh, I think it's very organical uh, transition into the second topic of our debate. I mean, technology. Uh, uh, probably this is a truism that uh, technology has impacted very much the aesthetic of uh, digital audio uh, concerning um, Commodore uh, uh, 64, SID cheap, uh, MOS 65. Uh, it's one which has been uh, utilizing, uh, for example, by uh, um, Swedish uh, uh, electron uh, firm, who, uh, which released uh, professional synthesizers and station built around this, this chip, uh, or uh, concerning Amiga 500 with 8-bit aesthetics and uh, wave tool synthesis with uh, early generations of uh, Sound Blasters card. But can you, can you feel still such limitations in in current uh, uh, world, and um, is uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, can such limitations be uh, uh, creatively stimulating? Well, from my perspective, there is no more limitations. That's it. The only limitation you have, of course, I mean, because there are limitations. All right, but uh, you know, if you, if you look at what people do with the tools they have, they're just scratching, you know, just, you know, like here. But they have so much more, you know, uh, po possibilities. Once again, with uh, this game, we went to, I mean, the music, which might feel weird, you know, but the music is happening in real time around you. And when I say real time, you know, it's something that is the core of what is a video game. You know, I've been thinking myself, I was like, okay, what is a what makes video games video games in my opinion you know and you're like it's the real time aspect because when we started and we had you know like first you know the pixel moving in real time with your action and then you have the lights then the ai then the physics then everything was in real time what about music why why do we do just recordings and play recordings you know and just like okay play stop fade doing all of those transitions you know i went crazy with my previous game Remember me, we went to record a full orchestra and next beat, depending on your movements, the music will change. That was crazy. But still, that was some sort of a script that was happening maybe in real time, but on a pre-recorded music. So now what you can do with you know, consoles or PC or computers and is create the music in real time. So what does it mean for a video game? In my opinion, it means that the music should blend with the audio in a way that it's no more like, oh, there is a layer of sound design, a layer of music, a layer of voiceover, but something that makes you know, a whole, thing, a whole narr narrative on its own. And we can do this with uh, technology nowadays. So it's the limitations, in my opinion, are ourselves. People don't do this yet. It's crazy. If you, I went all over the world, you know, like showing people this, you know, they were like, oh, that's amazing. You know, it's, it's, they won't do it. They won't do it. It's too much work. I totally agree with Olivier. Uh, for me, there are no limitations anymore. Uh, the current generation of PC uh, itself or uh, new generation of consoles are enough powerful and have enough memory to to fulfill my expectations, and I, I feel great with that. But uh, it's good to have a um, background from the past with the limitations when we used to work on some previous generations of consoles or uh, computers like C64 or Amiga, because we needed to learn how to swim in that limitations, and we needed to be more creative to, to, to achieve the goal. And right now, it helps a lot to be more creative, even if you don't have limitations. And I just want to say something about your um, your topic about the real-time mixing and blending. That's the risky shit, man. Because if it will happen, and it will happen in the real time, our services are not needed anymore. I mean, if it will happen but by, by itself. It's not writing the music in real time. 
you still write music. You know, it's just happening in real time. It's different. Okay, yeah, right. Anyway, I'm scared about the technology right now. Really. <laughs> I'm really sorry I got the message from my wife and I need to go out uh, because there are some problems in, in our house. So this is the answer. Uh, thank you, Alan. I'm really, really sorry. I have thank to go. You, thank you very much. Good luck for him. Make a noise. Okay. Is there a single piece of gear, a hardware or software uh, application, a plugin? Uh, who has defined your creative language? Um, a, techno a technological quick, piece. Quick. Uh, for me, it was Amiga 500. It was my first personal computer and my first instrument, to be honest. I never had a synthesizer, uh, so I started to compose music on the Amiga 500. And it exactly formed me because uh, I, I was forced to think differently like, to all the regular composers. I wasn't able to write notes. I, I, I composed on trackers uh, with the different way of uh, writing notes and different way of thinking about the, the, the sound of the music itself. So thanks to that, I started with totally different um, kind of creativity. Uh, I'm thinking about the music in the blocks, in the patterns which helps me a lot right now with the meaning of the interactive music, for example. So that's formed me and my, uh, my sensitivity about the music and the way of uh, thinking about the uh, creating music itself. Um, I think for me, uh, it's, it's mainly a technology that's called uh, Fast Free Transform, where you take like, uh, sound is like a linear media, it's like uh, waves uh, in the air, but then the technology, you can sort of flip it from horizontal to vertical, so you can see all the different uh, like uh, amplitudes of the different frequencies, uh, and then yeah, you can kind of uh, take one sound and process with the other, you could, uh, can uh, draw in the spectrum, uh, whatever. But, but apart from, from that, I, I don't really know. Um, I remember an interview with uh, David Lynch where he was asked about he, how uh, digital technology has influence on, on the cinema, and he was re replying that uh, digital t technology is just like pencil and paper. Everyone has that. But how many great stories are written. So I guess it's still about, you know, what's what we actually do with it rather than the technology itself. Well, um, two, two things. Um, com concerning composition, uh, the best tools, you know, are the ones that you want to make music with. So either it's, you know, synth, reactor, whatever, gear. I mean, orchestra, whatever. But for games, now, uh, there are few tools and one of them is called WISE, technology speaking, and it was a big turn in the industry because this software is it's used... It's software to implement uh, audio within the Yeah, it's, of game. it's a third-party software, so anybody, you guys, can download this and use that on your own and learn it, and it can become your DAW, like your station to create music. The thing is, what's very important, knowing WISE, is number one, you know, everybody in the industry from Halo to, you know, I guess, Limbo and Inside and My Games and uh, are using, we are using WISE. So it's the first time ever, you need to understand this, it's very important in the industry before this WISE and FMOD and, you know, everybody had its own tool. So you had to create and design your own tool, you know, for music, for sound design, for voiceover, which was painful for everybody so you couldn't go you know crazy because you had to have the basics for your tool now you have this tool and the thing is this tool is wild i mean you can do so many crazy things it's amazing so you have to learn the tool in order to really express you know what you could in the game which is you know something once again i'm sorry to say this i don't want to sound bitter because i'm not you know i'm doing exactly what i want to do but the industry is late you know, with the music approach, with the sound approach, comparing to the tools we have. It's crazy. You just play music in the background, and like, oh yeah, and we switch, you know, depending, oh, there is a fight, let's go to fight music, you know? So it's, 
it's not bad, it's effective, okay, but it's late comparing to the technology we have. So it's important to, to say that we're, let's say, uh, it's, it's funny, the technology is there, where usually it's the opposite. Everybody's like, oh, we would like the technology to go, you know, beyond. It's there already and nobody uses it enough, in my opinion. I know that um, you have mentioned that uh, limitation, technological limitations are no longer existent, but, but what about your predictions for future development of technology in digital audio? Uh, you, you have mentioned uh, uh, the uh, three-dimensional sound, for example. Yeah? We've, we've got uh, um, different systems of uh, multi-channel sound projections like Dolby Atmos, for example, in the commercial market. What about head tracking systems you, you've mentioned? What about um, binaural coding from IRCAM? for example. Uh, what about devices for users enable them to, to using different uh, uh, audio layers of game like gyroscopes in mobile phones, like in a um, um, blind side or Papa Sangri game, or, or, or more developed devices like a uh, diving helmet with, uh, 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 with um, headphones mounted into like in the deep sea game. So what about your predictions for future development in audio technology for, let's say, next five years? Yeah, I guess there was like two questions in there because one is about, you know, our creative possibilities and the other one was about how to execute uh, the game, uh, how the players can experience. Of course, you can't separate it entirely. I think the, um, uh, about the execution, um, I don't have much to say, so I'll leave that to, to you. Um, it's, it tends to always be like old-fashioned stereo that I'm doing. I don't, I don't know why. But for the, for the, for the um, more creative uh, tools, I was thinking, yeah, you're mes mentoring WISE. Uh, and I, I agree, it's a, it's, a great, it's a great tool. Uh, I think, though, there's still something um, uh, a bit like conservative in, in the way of thinking of, of, of that tool because it's very much about uh, I implementing the sounds. Uh, it's not so much about creating sounds. So what I would see would be something uh, in the lines of a, um, a kind of a combination of a, a tool like WISE and then a sequencer, uh, audio editor, or whatever, because it's, it's the WISE tool is very much you know, that you have your assets in advance and then it's about either considering it's a sound design and implementing it in one way or considering it as a traditional music, like the music system is, is very uh, uh, conservative in a way. Uh, so so what, what I'd like to see is, is more something that's, that's more like a, like a sequencer, the kind of the, the tools that we actually use to create the sound should be the same tool as the tool we use for implementing the sound. That's, that's my wish, <laughs> and it has been that for, for quite some years, and I'm, I'm doing my best to push it. But, but I, I, think I have no success. But so it's still. there, it's there. Uh, it's just, from my perspective, the issue is now limitations, we're back to limitations. What you want to do, you know, I'm pretty sure WISE can do it, because granular plugins, uh, you know, a lot of things, you know, happen. If you look at Quantum Break, this game, I don't know if, you were, if you've seen, you know, but they've worked on, you know, granular voices, and either it's French, English, or anything like this, it will work, you know, in real time. Me, uh, I'm using MIDI in WISE much more uh, uh, than audio, and the MIDI is applying, uh, you know, on a sign that you don't hear, that this sign will happen on a, a signal that will, um, you know, in a, um, a sidechain. Uh, I'm a little technical here, I'm sorry. But then it's, ju it's just for this guy, because he will, you know, understand a little. Uh, th then uh, you, you can, you know, apply this sidechain on any sound in the world and in real time, and uh, you can have, you know, a script. And the sequencer, in my opinion, it's not you, it's not wise, it's the game. It's the game that decides, and it's like, okay, parameters, you know, for your equal, equalizer or something like this, you go like, you create something like this in real time, you know, with parameters. So I believe that as composers, and you're right in some ways to say, oh, it, it won't be your music, you know, but that's the thing, that's, that's what we have to fight for, you know, it's like, oh, let's create something that we don't know what it is, but at least it's for games, you know. 
we can do this for games and we can develop a language and something that happens in real time and you know we don't understand exactly i mean we can predict but we can you know construct what will happen so truly the limitations are that if you want to create a very good sound in real time using like a lot of layers and things like this in real time once again so meaning that you start with a sign or you know wave uh, form or anything like this then yes it's complicated but just a reminder do you know piano tech so it's a technology so it's a piano it's a sample instrument so you go and you buy piano tech and you play with your midi and you hear piano and this piano is the best piano sound i came across okay it's the best and it's 20 megs large you know 20 megs where the contact library so when people go and record you know Senway and they go like and they go each note and they record that so for you you will do the same movements it will reproduce this that goes four gigs you know of ram so 20 megs in real time modular synth you know with i don't know what they're crazy so if this can be done in 20 megs with the technology you know going up and up and up now maybe a violin can be done in real time or maybe a synth you know and something like this and then in maybe 10 years everything will be in real time everything yeah i'm passionate <laughs> uh, to answer to your question about the new technologies uh I'm happy with them because of one of the reasons uh, important to, to us and our work. Uh, there is a bigger and bigger spot of our, for, for our work. If we, for example, taking uh, virtual uh, reality glasses, right, with the headphones, the sound is so close to, to you, so it's much more important for you, which means that our work is much more important and we can be proud of that and happy of that because many times the technology uh, needs only stereo speakers and nobody cares about that R right now because of the technology we are obligated to be better the quality of our work should be better and people will notice that and I think it's great part of the technology and for the future I believe that the sound and audio, all audio, will be much more important in the in the games than uh, before. Uh, you are talking about the importance of the quality of, of audio work, about the importance of the position of the composer and sound designer. But um, what about the technological availability? Availability. Okay. Um, the, the, the technological possibility of creating uh, great sounding. Uh, uh, soundtrack just using an ordinary application and mobile phone uh, uh, offering such amazing results uh, that in those ends years ago were, uh, were uh, uh, available only in a very well equipped studios uh, what about uh, the y y your feelings about democratization of the position of audio designer uh, composer yeah, I can only consider it as a positive thing uh, I think, though, if you have things that makes it very easy for you to do stuff that sounds great, then a lot of decisions will be made for you already, and the result will um, inevitably be more like uh, generic. Uh, so, if you want to create something unique, you'd still have to uh, to do some some hard work. But uh, I think it's a, it's a it's a positive thing, and uh, and and sure, you can easily get build like a home studio and, and do uh, do cool stuff so uh, I think that's the dark side of the technology uh, because the technology is uh, getting better and better every day right now we have some composers called one button hero and uh, that's not fair and not good uh, I'm afraid about that uh, because you know uh, you heard about that probably the AI is starting to compose the music itself and it's getting better day by day I hope that it will happen later than sooner that uh, we will be not needed anymore but uh, well you you see the applications on the mobiles it can do many things and uh, yeah that's crap I don't know I'm not sure uh, I totally agree that a lot of people pretend to compose when they're just edit you know it's uh, now 
you know, it's a trend, and that's that's exactly why we should keep moving forward. You know, not getting stuck, you know, into this way of composition doing because now they can do it just by pr pressing one button. So let's go and find other ways. You know, that's the only way you will survive, man. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> Due to the lack of Christoph, we've earned some five-minute time for uh, the, the next uh, uh, round of uh, question from audience. So don't hesitate to ask our guests about uh, technology or maybe something more. Come on. Sorry. Uh, I don't know if it's like for everybody, but I, w I would like to listen more about some details about your work real time. So are you composing was like really score or are you using some generative music or because to go real time you, you can use both. So what's your way to work with real time music? So, so that, that was a, an experiment I did on this game. So get even um, and it's the difficulty is exactly what you mentioned, is like, how do you compose when it's happening in real time, okay? So it has to be uh, very well prepared. So let's say, for instance, you know, um, the premises of this game was like, you cannot start a music without having a real sound world, like something concrete. So let's say a police siren, okay? So at some point there is a police investigation, so what we have was like a police siren, and this police siren was happening. So in the game, you know, 3D. And then because we have um, a clock, because time is a lot involved, involved in the game. So what we have is a police siren. So the police siren is just a sign in real time. Like this, very easy. And then we have a clock, and the clock actually is not like, um, let's say, a recording on the clock, of a clock, but it's a sound triggered what we call in MIDI. So it's like every time there is a trigger comes in, it goes like this, it starts a clock. And this was like on a sequence, but of one measure, I'm sorry, it's going to be technical, all right? But it's like one measure or one beat that's going to be in loop like this. And there is a tempo attached to that, okay? And the tempo will change. Why the tempo change, we can change as well the sound of the clock. So the s slower the sound will be like but the sound is not something that is, uh, let's say, um, it's played in real time, so recorded in real time, then because of, you know, you know this feeling, uh, you're going down, so it, you know, it's going down. But then the thing is, how do you attach music to this? How do you compose music with this? So what I did is, because uh, I went to record a 25-piece string in Brussels, and the thing was that, I had this sort of tempo like, you know, happening with the siren and things. And every time the tempo was kicking in, the siren would go like, side chain. Okay. And then the siren, you know, little by little, I would have the strings coming and following the siren like this. And I would know, you know, the tempo because everything is in real time. Once again, I have control. Okay. And so me, when I was, are you following us? <laughs> I'm sorry if it's confusing. Okay, I can ask later after. But you know, the process was that I had to have the final picture in my head prior to compose and be like, okay, what will be in real time completely, meaning that it it will lead the game, decide the speed of the music, the speed you know of sounds, meaning that there was no recording like you know a bounce of music. It was all happening with triggers. And every triggers, like a piano note or anything, were just notes, okay? So do da 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 were like, you know, triggers, do da 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 It was not a recording of da-da-da-da-da. So it can go like faster, slower, and things like this. And then at some point, you know, during the game, because it's a very linear game, we have, you know, uh, pre-recorded, so the strings coming in, and then I have control of the tempo, and I'm like, okay, you stick there. The, the wonderful thing was that I could also send information back so the clock on the wall would go, you know, visually, you see the clock that was in sync with the music. So as you guys did for the uh, inside and things like this, you know, so we have a conversation, you know, between the game visuals and the audio and it can go both ways. So the gameplay is a uh, 
sequence uh, of the uh, whole uh, yeah. audio layer within the game. Yeah, and th the beautiful thing is that I'm not giving the, you know, I'm just giving away the parameters for the game. It's like, you do whatever you want. I don't know what's going to happen because it depends on the players. Would you go fast? Would you go slow? Would you go intense? Would you go, you know? So the, at some point, uh, that's funny, that's a good example. You are in asylum and people are knocking on doors, blam, 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 like this. And you're going through, you know, in 3D. And in one room, there is a music, like string, you know, -do 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 -do. and you know, you're here, it's a mess. And all of a sudden, all of the guys are knocking in time with the music. And the closer you get, it gets, you know, it's accelerating and accelerating and you're like, oh my God, but it's all musical, you know, it's not sound design only, it's music and you get like this emotion, it's happening within the world. And of course, what's beautiful is that then you attach the score. Uh, can you feel it? We are also organically transitioning into the third part of our discussion on uh, journal theories uh, about uh, digital audio, about uh, game audio uh, uh, in that case. Uh, because you've mentioned a situation in which a user became a conductor of a score. So, um, f first of all, much more philosophical question. What, what is, uh, in your opinion, a function uh, or functions of a uh, music audio layer uh, within a game? Mm, I guess for me it's probably mostly like setting the mood or as you said before like supporting uh, you know the game and, and what, what the game is, <laughs> is, uh, is trying to uh, communicate. Um, to, to support a plot, to support a uh, uh, mood to support uh, pace. Um, yeah, all of all of that uh, definitely. Uh, now the the two first games I did, uh, Limbo and Inside, was very you know without dialogue or anything. So it was it was more like um, like the arc through the game was more like a poetic uh, movement in a way. So it was very much about yeah exactly pace and. Uh, um, and also dealing with the uh, difficulties of, of this kind of uh, uh, f uh, flexible timing, uh, the nonlinear thing, like if you get stuck in a puzzle or, you know, you can easily as a player, you know, get uh, very annoyed with, 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 uh, with the music. And in that way, I'm, I'm kind of saying that uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the most important job is not to be annoying, but uh, it's, you know, it's. I remember, uh, you know, it's doing something great is kind of ten percent of the job, and then you spend ninety percent of the job, you know, making it work in all scenarios. Uh, uh, probably a bit of a messy answer, but uh, for me, the function is so easy to describe. We supporting usually we are supporting uh, visuals. Uh, with the sound design and uh, music, we are talking about the emotions. We are describing the emotions you can see on the screen or you can't see on the screen because it's something happening around, but you, you can't see that. We also supporting the visuals from, uh, in example, uh, in the games, uh, shooters. You have some weapons, right? You, you can see how it looks like but you can't judge how heavy it is. So the sound uh, describes how heavy it is. Is it broken, is it old, rusty or not? The same about the footsteps, for example. You can judge how big the, the person is thanks to the sounds, right? Is it heavy or light? Uh, is it have uh, sp sp sparks uh, on, on the boots or not? Um, so, that's the major uh, function of the of the of the sounds and, and music. Uh, of course, there are some projects uh, which are audio dedicated, and this is a totally different story. So Martin had a luck to 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 to, to do something more with the audio uh, than usually I have opportunity. I'm mainly working on the shooters. God damn it! And uh, that's a different story. Uh, but yeah. In short, it's something like that. No. Yeah, I know. I know. You know it's coming. <laughs> well, um, I had a lot of discussions with our, you know, 
friends, composers, audio directors. So no, uh, actually, uh, the thing is, for video games, the, um, that's the major issue I have with people concerning audio in video games. Many times you hear it's to support the emotions, to support the mood as a function, you know, which is right. But it's just, you know, a quarter of what it does. You know, you can support, uh, let's say, the feedback, like give players information, you know, with music, I mean, uh, sound design as well, but with music, feedback. S sorry to interrupt you, because what is the main difference between the working uh, for linear audio, for feature films, for example, and to... That's, that's uh, exactly that. It's because people tend to look at games on YouTube and say, oh, the game is amazing. You know, and you're like, oh, how do you know? I watched it on YouTube. And you're like, no, you didn't play the game. If you play the game, okay? So let's say I'm playing the game and I'm fighting and there's a beautiful mountains in the back, you know? And someone is watching me and he's like, that's amazing. Look at the setting and thing. And I'm like, I don't give a hell, you know, you know, I'm just dying here. Please let me be, you know, I don't care about these mountains and anything like this. Of course, if the story wants you to focus on the mountain, you want with the music to support that. But that's the, that's the point, is that a game is not a story. A game is not, I mean, only, okay? A game is not a journey only, okay? It's an experience, you know, an experience as a active uh, you know, player, like you're active into this. So music can play with this, you know, so feedback, reward, you know, emotions, of course, but all the intentions, you know, that you can bring to players that are not something that are just emotions, because emotions are for movies. That's for sure, because you want, you know, you're passive. The only thing you get is like the immersion of, you know, the but when you're active, you're like, oh, I don't give a damn, you know, I, I, want, I want this sword or I want, okay, forget even, you know, I want to save this girl or, you know, so it's completely different and you have to change your way of thinking like me, myself, this is very personal, but I never start with the story of a game ever. I'm always like, okay, what's the gameplay mechanic? You know, because what's a game? What is a game? If you start asking this question to people that makes game, they would be like, well, a game is a... Uh, it's a story, you know, or something like this. But then if you, you know, work and work with them, because we've been through this so many times with friends and, you know, all over the world, you know, game is just, you know, mechanics. They just have to find the right mechanics. So, of course, Limbo and its side are here to prove that it's not, you know. It's a succession of situations, you know, which is amazing. But it's very linear here, you know. Most games are what they do, and they... they cheat with you, you know, they just do like th two, three, four gameplay mechanics and then they threw out, you know, through the whole game. <coughs> so what is your definition of game? Uh, real time experience, tactile experience of a user in a very particular... Um, well, I would go more, more like theoretical, you know, it's, it's not this. A game is what we call gameplay. What is gameplay? It's on one side game design, on the other side level design. So game design is the creation of the mechanics, level design is the application of these mechanics throughout the whole experience. So, you know, let's say for Remember Me, a game I've scored, the game design was the, bat the fighting, okay? That was like a big chunk of the game, like half of the game. So we wanted to score this, you know, very gameplay mechanic. And then the level design was using this and like, oh, you're exploring fight. You're exploring cutscenes, whatever, fight, you know, so much more like a movie or anything like this. So that's how a game is made, actually. They don't care about the environment. All of a sudden, this mechanic can be in medieval age, you know, sci-fi or anything like this. Of course, it changed the style of the music, but not the function of the music. I guess also relating to the question, uh, what's the difference between linear and non-linear media, like between feature films and and games. Um, there's also, I would add, a big difference between like 2D games and 3D games. Like Limbo and Inside is uh, basically a, a side scroller, so you go from from A to B. So it's it's pretty linear actually. The only I'm kind of in control of the experience. The only thing that's flexible is you know when. Uh, the different parts is happening because the player can linger in one area and he can be fast in another, so I have to be uh, flexible in that way. Uh, and I like that you're mentoring the, you know, sending feedback uh, 
from the the audio back into the game, I think that's still a, a bit like overlooked. Uh, it's a really strong way of creating a connection between the audio and and, and, and the visual. Also, because music is it's an uh, it's a time art. You know, it's a, it's solely depending on on, on time. Uh, so why not, when there's a uh, possibility, let the music uh, direct uh, the game, and um, yeah, uh, and yeah, yeah, the visuals, but also the game. Sometimes we try that in in inside to actually have uh, the game mechanics uh, controlled uh, by the sound. So that if you have, if there's some kind of a loop or some kind of timing going on then uh, the player can actually use uh, the pace of the mu music or the pulse of the music to actually be able to, to solve the puzzles, even without noticing. You know, but there were some puzzles there that you couldn't really uh, solve without with, with the sound turned off. Well, for me, games are something we can call a real-time experience. Uh, because right now the games are so different, some telling stories, some are just about the mood, some are regular shooters or platform games, so it's really hard to to find a name uh, which connects all of that kind of games. Um, as uh, guys uh, said, uh, there are some cool uh, wave or, uh, ways of implementation, the, the sounds uh, or collaboration of sound with the visuals. Uh, I noticed uh, last times, uh, uh, and I had some nice chat with my friends from game development uh, industry, that there is something really weird. We trying to give the experience, real-time experience to the players, just to make them, you know, having some nice, excellent experience. But people are too busy or too lazy nowadays to take it, to enjoy that. And right now we notice that most of the people prefer to watch the walkthroughs of the games on YouTube and listen to someone who commands that game, that play the game itself and have that experience we trying to give them. It's surprisingly bad and I don't know the solution, but it looks like that. You can see the amount of views of the YouTube gameplays, and you can see how many games selling right now, and the proportions are so scary. That's it. <laughs> Martin, uh, you, you have some expertise in uh, artwork also. Uh, you've made some uh, uh, sound design for performers. Can, can you compare uh, the situation of delivering music to the game audio, to the game and to the uh, uh, performance, which is also a, a three-dimensional real-time experience? Yeah, it's kind of an interesting uh, combination because um, the performance, at least the one I've been working with, um, like performance installation, so they are kind of non-linear in a way, so <laughs> it's, it's kind of similar, you know, to build up soundscapes that kind of uh, surrounds the, the performance. So, yeah, it's actually closer to games than to, like, uh, fixed media, like uh, theatre. Um, I did a piece uh, this year with the performance group, uh, which is, like, site-specific. So there was a city in uh, Germany, Mannheim, uh, which is like abandoned because of uh, the American uh, troops or whatever. So it's like a ghost city. So they had like two buildings and a church that was uh, abandoned. Uh, and then uh, we set up the, the sound installation there, also using like audio transducers playing all the sound through the, the, the windows and big like horn speakers in the top of the church tower. So it's like you would be like immersed in, in sound in like a small part of, of the city, but in a very like physical way, you wouldn't see any speakers. Uh, it would just be like s sound playing from windows and furniture and stuff like that. And that <coughs> had, of course, because it's something that's just it's playing there. It's, it's not really a lot of interaction there. So it's it's more about making the different rooms, uh, the different areas play together in kind of random 
ways that 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 makes a kind of a variation. Um, we, we have talked about uh, the blurring boundary between music and uh, audio uh, audio design uh, in game. Is the boundary still exist or uh, it's irrelevant? Irrelevant? No, there are no any boundaries because uh, always music and sound existing together. Uh, and the tricky thing is that uh, sometimes music changes to sound design uh, and sounds like sound design or sound design became uh, music because it's starting to be rhythmic and taking a role of the music. So uh, you can't say this is a music, this is a sound design, and this is a border between them. They always need to be all together. And if they s exist together, they need to be um, they need to be done smartly. I mean, for example, the sound design needs to be tuned to the, t to the tuning of the music, or the music should be tuned to the sound design, just to not to make a noise, you know, uh, just to not to, to, to fight each other. Uh, music needs to uh, make a place for the sound design in the specific places, just to be sure that there will be huge explosion and nothing should be there except the exp explosion. While the sometimes sound design needs to be um, More uh, simple because there is a place spot for the music. So you never should talk about the uh, border, the, 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 the differences. They always are connected and, and always are uh, depending on each other. Well, there are two, two answers to this, I mean, two aspects. Uh, the number one is, when does music start? What do you call music, you know? Because it's complicated. It's complicated nowadays because, as I said earlier, and as they made in Limbo and Inside, I mean, you don't even know when it comes to sound design or music, is it music? You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's complicated, you know? So what is music? What, so. If I want to very much, you know, exaggerate, I would say that music it's when the 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 sounds make something that is I don't know, I don't know how in English intelligible like something that makes sense on its own has a a narration like something like a structure something you know you discussed a little bit at the beginning of the conversation you know when it everything is like let's say not maybe tempo based but you know they play all together. There is something. There is a, a pattern. There is something that makes them autonomous. Oh. Yeah, feel like a whole. Self-efficient. Yeah. yeah. So it's complicated to to you know to to be like, okay, what's music? What's sound design nowadays? It's very difficult because you know the trend. Let's say in the if you watch any series, you know TV series, TV shows, you know most of the musics they're just like soundscapes. You know, like this guy. You remember? <laughs> And, and, you know, it goes like, and sometimes it's very interesting uh, textures. And I'm not saying it's not interesting, but is it music? Is it sound design? I, I'm not even sure myself. So that's number one. And number two, it doesn't, I mean, what matters is the people in charge. That's what matters. Most people, what they do in the game industry, what they have is like, oh, there is sound design and there is music as I said earlier, you know? And so what they do is well, someone uh, will do the sound design, someone, and an audio director will blend the two, you know, manage the two, depending on, you know, how it will go. But the audio direction, something, once again, I'm sorry to pointing every time at you, but that was so perfect, like inside or limbo, you know, it, it feels there is an audio direction. There is, it's a whole, you cannot take one out of the other. It makes sense, you know? And that's what matters most, most to me. Nowadays, you know, to make sense. So uh, it's difficult in video games, not because only of the, uh, the, the people, but always on the process, you know, how we work. Yeah, I agree with, with uh, both of you. Although I, I guess what, what you're describing is uh, our dream scenario. I'm not sure it, it happens uh, very often. Uh, and as Olivia said, it's, it's about the people involved. 
and to some extent also about the software now thinking of wise with the kind of division between sound design and and, and 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 music so i think it's it's kind of a, a habitual way of working uh, to say yeah someone is doing the music and someone is uh, doing the sound design i guess on limbo and inside i was just uh, lucky to do do both uh, myself and then being back, back to my background it's uh, you know it's I consider it as music, uh, but it's kind of a broader notion of, of music. So even like footsteps or whatever I would consider in a musical uh, fashion. Um, it, it won't be a question, it, it, uh, but I, I'd like to share with you some, some thoughts about the history of uh, contemporary music. You, you've mentioned Peter Schaeffer, Music Concrete, and um, developing some questions for our uh, meeting, um, I thought about um, some, some experimental composers of 60s, like uh, Cornelius Cardew or John Cage, uh, who wanted to liberate music from the oppression of musical score by involving uh, uh, audience participation uh, in producing some noises or, or, or um, more elaborated musical gestures. And uh, I think in uh, game audio, we've, we've got exactly the same situation in which a, a user, a, a, a gamer, uh, became a composer, uh, uh, a, 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 a musical pro producer, or... Uh, um, what is your definition about the role of a user in interactive uh, digital audio? How do you define and how you value the, the role of a... Uh, uh, a user uh, mm, within the digital audio world. I just had this conversation yesterday, and this is what I said in the end. Um, I think that you know, music. It was like 50 years ago that they started doing this. You know, like trying to get away from you know this kind of rules and creating new rules. I mean, Stravinsky started, you know, and then you know it went Pierre Boulez and all of that. Uh, meaning that this art that is very old, I mean, it's ancestral, you know, music is very old, okay? It's just the last 50 years we're doing this for music. Video games is a very, very young industry, and the audience is very young, okay? So you have to consider this. You have to consider that the people that are playing games, if they listen to John Adams, they'd freak out. They'd be like, what the hell is going on, you know? Of course, you can use some, you know, contemporary styles like, you know, horror games and all of that. You know, Inferno's Dante by Gary Scheiman, you know, features a lot of effects like this. But those effects were taken from movies that were taken from, you know, these uh, John Cage in uh, styles. So my point is that we first need to understand that video games is a very, very young industry towards a very young audience. I'm suffering, you know, about this because, like, get even. This game is if you don't, if you're not a male, 35 years old with a daughter, you won't like the game. You won't understand the game, you know. So it's difficult uh, to to talk about something that is more mature. So this approach, as a musician, might be interesting, but it's experimental. So it won't, for now, come to you know a let's say mass market video game. It will for uh, you know indie games and things like this. Pretty sure, that's my take. Well, uh, it should be a long, um, <laughs> but in short, uh, most of us are uh, visually oriented. I don't know the English uh, description of that, but our major sense is uh, eyes, our eyes, and we describe the world mainly using uh, the words "what I see." The same about the players. Most of the players are just watching the games and the visuals are the most important thing for them. With the meaning of the audio, there are much less listeners oriented by the ears. Probably all of us are mainly ear oriented. We are listening to the world and then we are watching the world. With the meaning of that, if the percentage of the visual oriented and listener uh, listeners, uh, we it's hard for us to uh, involve the players into creating the audio because they first they they uh, need to want that they they need to say okay i want to be involved in that and then 
we can create some tools and uh, invite him to, to do what you ask for. Uh, right now, uh, the role of the players uh, usually is much less than we would expect and we would like to, uh, to get from them. So uh, it's, it's, maybe it's a hard word, uh, but I say that right now the players we are working for, for, for the music for them are mainly a pain in the ass because we need to predict all the situations and find out all the ways uh, they can do in the games and we just need to, 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 to do that scenarios with the meaning of audio. But we probably we can't uh, invite him to create the audio because they don't need that. Or a little part of the players need that. And from the business side of making a games, it's you know it's not worth of doing. I guess there's a kind of similarity in the way that, that both those composers you mentioned, like Cage and, uh, and and video games, we want to involve the player, of course. But uh, I think in in games, at least for me, it's not like in a in a conscious way, you know, it's like I want to involve the player in the experience, but I don't want him to be or her to be conscious um, uh, about that. So it's it's very much like uh, being a bit like sneaky and not uh, showing how or revealing how things are working or it can be kind of too literal if something happens in the game and then sound comes in it can be like too literal in a way so I would always try to kind of to kind of hide that to engage the player but uh, but without having them having uh, them having the the feeling that they are actually uh, doing it if you see what I mean um, music and sound design is always about time and we are about uh, out, of out of time, but still I think we've got enough time uh, for at least one question from, from you. Hi, I've got a question. Um, how do you deal uh, with a problem when you, for example, you get stuck on the creating the music for uh, your uh, initial idea didn't work. For a f for example, there is a scene, and you thought, "Oh, this music will be great." You tried to do some stuff, and it didn't work. And how do you deal with those kind of situations when you are simply stuck and can't find the right idea for the music setup? And it's uh, for me. It's uh, the whole uh, trick is about realizing that what you do is bad. You know, and that can be really hard to realize that, you know. But the sooner that you realize it's it's bad, the sooner you can get on with uh, something else. But I'm, you know, it's just I'm thinking about it all the time. And even when I'm in the situation and I'm sitting and working a week, and maybe the f the last two days, uh, I know this is this is not great, you know. And I'm still trying. Uh, but if I do it like, but uh, it's it's just about you know as soon as possible just uh, scrap it and get on with some, something new but I, yeah, I experience that a lot it's tough well usually you need to get a break just disconnect shut down all your project go for a walk have a break one two days if it doesn't work drink <laughs> And then uh, ask yourself, maybe it's not worth of uh, you know uh, trying to to make some tweaks on that. Maybe you should start your work from the scratch. It's painful, but as Martin said, if you find out it early, it's less painful than later. You know what I mean? Uh, and well, also it depends if you are stuck or you are stuck with your client. Because maybe you feel it's right you are doing, it's correct, but your client saying no, it's not correct. That's the second problem, because you can be stuck between your feelings and your way of uh, doing against the expectations of your client. And that second story, you, you, you need to deal with that. You can just quit the, 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 the deal, or you can try to, to talk with the client because he picked you 
and he should know that this is your way of uh, doing the art. He should expect something which you can do. So um, that's long story, which probably Olivier will explain. <laughs> Thank you for your question, and uh, I would like to convince you to follow an advice of uh, Adam, uh, have a break, uh, have a drink, uh, some coffee rather. Uh, but before, uh, thank you very much for our thank guests uh, to join our debate. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.